Well, everybody, welcome. Um, that's the, those folks that have just just popped in. Um, a little bit different this morning. Uh, hopefully, you can see Gami frozen uh, on your screen. Uh, he is going to be our teacher this morning, but because of how it worked out in the changes this last week of him scheduled to teach and also when the worship team needed to um, prepare now that we're live streaming from the church, um, he's there actually right now uh, with the worship team um, prepping uh, all that for the, for the 1030 live stream. And so he pre-recorded his teaching time um, and with a couple of, but we'll still have a couple of different, well, two 15 minute breakout sessions and I'll kind of pause the video and put you into there and I'll kind of help uh, guide some of the logistics and some of the discussion uh, around that. But the bulk of the teaching uh, here is Gami's, is Gami's prep and, and, and his work. So, um, so hopefully this is all the technology is going to work and uh, be able to, we'll be able to listen to Gami's uh, teaching and, and follow along. I'll be following along um, just like, just like you all are, and then we'll, we'll get to have a good discussion. So, um, so yeah, with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just, I'll pray for us quickly here. Gami will open us up you know, with some of his own instructions and, and, and his, his prayer time and, and stuff too. So let me just pray for us though right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for this new day. Thank you for sunshine. Thank you for uh, just getting together to uh, come together with your people to study your word. Lord, help us to know how to read, uh, read your word and, and learn from it. Lord, I pray then the, the word will do its work of convicting us and draw us, drawing us even closer uh, to your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen. All right, guys, if you have any problems or anything while the video is going on, um, feel free to use the chat window and um, I'll be dropping a few things in there from the, the notes as well. But if you have any issues um, or if it's not coming through, um, be sure to speak up and and let me know. I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody uh, though now so we can all be focused on Gami. Hey, good morning, Katsuth. My name is Gami. I'm the pastor's here, and um, I'm sorry that I cannot actually be um, part of this class um, in this moment. I am currently leading a worship practice so that we, we are ready for our gathering later on at 10.30. And I can't be in two places at once, so this is the uh, next best thing. So my thanks goes out to the team that um, are helping out with this and um, making this available to you and leading the discussion times and so forth, doing all that, the logistics board. I'm, I'm very grateful for them, for for this aspect of it, as well as for the, um, their teaching and helping me to teach this material um, throughout this time. I'm, I'm, I'm really, really thankful for, for the team that we have. So um, make sure you give them your thanks as well for their involvement here. Uh, before we jump in then this morning, let me just open us up in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. Thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word. I thank you for each person that's uh, tuning in here this morning and, and who have been a part of this class um, through this process um, and through, through, the, um, through this course. God, I thank you for their heart that they are wanting to and, and have a passion to know you more and to know your word more and how to how to study it. And God, I pray that you would bless them, bless all of us with the wisdom to understand your word. Give us um, understanding through your Holy Spirit. Um, and God, I pray that you would also give us the desire and the passion to make our lives applicable um, and reflecting what um, we see in your word. So God, give us not only the, the eyes and the minds to understand, but uh, the eyes to see, the mind to understand, but also the heart to follow and obey. And so we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we're going to continue on with the course that we're walking through this book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. And we've probably heard this half a dozen times already, but um, what the authors are trying to do in that book, just in case you're tuning in um, for the first time, is to walk us through the different genres of scripture and giving us principles, little nuggets of how we can best understand that particular genre of scripture. Each genre has uh, particularities and, and different things that we ought to have in mind as we approach it so that we can get the most out of it um, for our personal um, study of scripture. And so um, I hope that thus far that's been helpful and I pray that it would continue to be so for the next uh, month or so that we um, continue on in the series. So this morning we're going to look at the prophets. Um, <laughs> the prophets 
uh, are probably one of those genres that most people don't think of as, uh, yeah, that's that's where I want to study. That's where I want to um, start doing my, you know, my, my devotional reading or anything like that. But um, there are more individual books in this genre than any other genre. There are 16 books of prophecy, you know, kind of the four major prophets and the 12 minor prophets. Um, and so that doesn't mean that there's more um, in terms of, of length, but a book wise, in terms of the individual books, there are more than any other genre of scripture. Now, let me, um, I mentioned minor and major prophets. When I, when I use that term, when, when, when people use that term, um, it, it doesn't refer to books that are more important than others. When we talk about major prophets versus minor prophets, we're talking about the length of the book. Minor prophets, which are the last 12 books of the Old Testament, uh, are, are shorter. And so we're talking about length of the book, not importance. Um, definitely, there's a lot of value and a lot of importance in the minor prophets as short of books as they were. Now let's talk a little bit about the nature of prophecy, um, because a lot of the misunderstandings here um, come from just misunderstanding the nature as well as the function of prophecy. So we're going to hit on that um, first and foremost. A lot of people, when they think of prophecy, they think of um, foretelling or you know talking about the future future events that are that are going to take place. And while that's not wrong. Um, we, we, we tend to verge into misunderstanding the books of prophecy when we look at them only as foretelling um, of Jesus or of the new covenant um, as it's going to come. Because less than 2% of the Old Testament prophecy is messianic, meaning pointing toward Christ, and less than 5% of it is talking about the new covenant. And, and actually even less than 1% is talking about future events that still even haven't happened. So you're talking about a, a minority when we're talking about predictive prophecy. And one of the keys to understanding the prophets is that for us to see those prophecies that are there as fulfilled already. And so they may have been in Israel's future, but they are in our past. And so we have to keep that in mind as well. And that actually can help us um, because it can help us put it into context. Um, and while I'm talking about putting that into context, um, let me talk a little bit about how these books of prophecy are different from the prophets that we read about in the narratives. For example, Elijah and Elisha, you, know, you see them in, in Kings and we um, see who they are and what they do more than read about what they say. And that's a major difference, right? What they say is packaged neatly into the context of what they're doing and in the historical uh, situation and all that. Um, they, they come together and so it's a little bit easier for us to understand what's going on as opposed to books of prophecy where you have passages that sometimes you don't even know where one prophecy ends and the next one begins, um, let alone what context it's referring to because it's contained in just in that book and it's not set into the historical setting for us. So these are some of the challenges that we come into when we're approaching a book of prophecy in the Old Testament. Um, but that, that, that just means that we have a little more legwork to do in terms of, of um, trying to put it in the right place so that we can get everything that we can out of, out of that. So now let's talk about function of prophecy. Again, prophecy, um, as we're looking at biblical prophecy, isn't just about foretelling the future. So looking at the prophets, we have to understand what their function was um, in their context. And so one of the ways that we have to look at the prophets, uh, one thing that we have to understand about them is that their primary function was to act as um, messengers from God. Their primary role was to speak for God to his people, not just to them. Um, he also, they also spoke to um, other nations as well of, of, of God's judgment, but they were God's spokespersons. There's the, the way that we can look at that. And so in terms of function, that was their, their, their purpose and their role. And so some part of their function uh, was to be uh, mediators of the covenant, right? God established the covenant with Israel, and then the prophets worked as mediators of that covenant and um, speaking for God to his people about that and about um, the ways that they uh, were being blessed because of 
of um, them keeping the covenant or they were being judged because they weren't keeping the covenant and, and so forth. So God announced his enforcement of the law that he had previously given to them through the prophets so that those blessings and those warnings and uh, and even the, the curses would be clearly understood by the people through that prophet. Second of all, the prophets were um, reproducing the word of God, um, not their own, right? They were, again, God's spokespersons. And so they were directly speaking for God, not in their own wisdom and in their own words. The message wasn't theirs. Maybe how they said it was stylistically theirs, but the message itself was God's. Um, you'll read so many times in the books of prophecy, um, and this was the word of the Lord, or the uh, the Lord has said, and so on and so forth. Um, the prophets wanted to make sure that the people understood that this is, this is God speaking to you. This is God's message to you. Um, and not only were they speaking directly for God, but they were God's direct representatives. So what we read in the books then is not uh, merely God's word as the prophet saw it, but God's word as God wished the prophet to present it. So the, the prophet's not acting or speaking independently from God. So now what I want you to do, um, we're going to take a, a pause here and do our first group time this morning. We'll, we'll have a couple of these um, during today's class. And I want you to read Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Let me say that again. Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And maybe somebody can write it in the uh, comment section there too, in the chat box. And I want you to work through these three questions as you read this in the group. First of all, what is the tone of the prophet's message in, in these six verses? What is the tone of the prophet's message? Two, how does he reference God's law, right? We talked about the fact that God gave his law to Israel and the prophets were mediators of that covenant or that law. And so how does he reference God's law in these, uh, in this passage? And are there unique features of how it's stated? Okay, that, um, that's question number two, even though it's two questions. Yeah, that's question number two. And then third of all, is the message of the prophet unique? Um, how is it unique or how is it not unique? Okay, again, two questions, but it's really only one. So three questions. One, what is the tone of the prophet's message? Two, how does he reference God's law and other unique features of how he does that? And then three, is a, how or how is the message not unique? So um, whoever's helped me out with the video here is going to stop the video and put you into your... Um, breakout rooms, breakout groups. And so I want you to take about 15 minutes. You can keep track of the time there, 15 minutes to read this and discuss those three questions, and then you'll come back. All right, welcome back. Hopefully you've had those 15 minutes to be able to read the passage and to uh, discuss those questions among you. Hopefully you noticed um, these couple things that I'm gonna point out here. So in verse one, you saw the word of the Lord, right? This is the word of the Lord. Um, I have it right here in front of me. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. Right? So, again, Hosea is making sure that the people understand this is this is God who's speaking to them, not his words. Right? And then he states the condition of the nation. And he paints a pretty bleak picture of where Israel's at in this, in this time. And then in verse 2, I hope you notice that he names five commandments, but in a different way. Right? He names five of the Ten Commandments, which would cause them to, to go back and be like, okay, that was five of them, and then probably even list them off, even mentally, what all ten of them were, because he doesn't name them in order. Right? They're all out of order, and, and again, it's not all ten of them. And so, uh, it, in a way, it's emphasizing these commandments, or the commandments in general, by picking out these specific five so that it stands out and they're, they're more likely to take note. If, if you were to name off the Ten Commandments or even just these five in the order that they appear, um, it would be less impactful because it'd be something they'd be used to hearing in that way as opposed to the way that Hosea actually does that. Um, and then in verses four through six, um, he starts talking of consequences that are coming, right? And these consequences, what's important to recognize is that these consequences are not unique. 
This isn't something unique that God is telling them is going to befall them, or even that Hosea is telling of them. These, these categories of blessings and cursings are present in Leviticus 26, and Deuteronomy 4, and Deuteronomy 28 through 32. The message has already been spoken by God uh, previously to this, and they, and they all know this, right? It's in the law, in the Pentateuch, and it's reiterated by Hosea um, of God's enforcement of that law that was previously. So we go back to this me function of being the mediator of the covenant, um, reproducing the word of God, which again was already present um, there in the Pentateuch in the, in, in the book of the law. Um, and Hosea was di God's direct representative in, in this situation. So you see all, the, all of that coming together um, in these six verses in Hosea. Uh, and, I, and I hope that that helped. Um, and, and maybe the way in which Jose is communicating this, again, using those five uh, commandments out of order, is perhaps unique to Hosea, um, but it's not unique in the sense that he didn't come up with this. Um, this is something that was written in the book of the law already. So the exegetical task, okay, moving here into what our role and what our task is, look, um, digging into the books of prophecy. The exegetical task, and exegesis, if you remember, is to understand what the original audience understood then and there, right? So the exegetical task for us is to understand just that, what the original audience heard then and there, what they understood. And in order to do that, and we've covered this before, is, is we need some historical context here. In order to do good exegesis, in order to understand well enough what they understood, we need to understand the larger historical context, which means like the context of the era, um, of that time period, if you will, as well as the specific context, the specific circumstances that caused those words to be spoken. And, and that's gonna be true for each book of prophecy, both the larger context as well as the specific context of each. And that's really hard to do from a casual reading. That's, um, that doesn't, doesn't come about from us picking up the book. Because again, there's no historical context in the book itself. In other books, such as when we looked at the epistles, you can, you can glean what the context is um, by what the author is saying. Uh, a lot of those by Paul, by what Paul is saying in the epistles. Um, even in the Old Testament narratives, you, can, you get a sense of the, of the context because they're writing about it. That's harder to do with these books of prophecy. And so here's the deal with the books of prophecy. We're gonna need help with this one. We are, we are gonna to have to dig into some um, sources that are gonna help point this out to us. And so there's three main sources, and I've talked about these before, again, but I'm gonna point them out again. One is the Bible dictionary. The Bible dictionary um, is, is helpful. Uh, specifically in a Bible dictionary, if you go to the, that particular book's name within a Bible dictionary, it'll, it can give you um, the time frame that it was written in, the historical context and those type of things, which is really helpful. Commentaries. So if you pick up a single commentary on that particular book, so you pick up a, a commentary on the book of Hosea or the book of Isaiah, um, again, it's going to have those details and it's going to probably even go into a little bit more detail than a Bible dictionary. Bible dictionary is going to um, be pretty broad. Commentaries are going to be very specific because you got a whole book for um, for a book um, of scripture, and you can get a combination of these two things in the third resource, which is a study Bible, and that's probably the most one cost effective because you're not talking about buying 66 different books um, commentaries in order to do that. Um, but it's, but it's going to give you more information than what a Bible dictionary would because it has some commentary in it. It also has cross-references where it's especially helpful um, in what we're talking about, about linking uh, prophecy with their historical context within Scripture itself. So that all being said, let me build a general framework here. The larger context um, of the books of prophecy, interestingly enough, um, are part of a rather narrow window of Israel's history. Um, in light of the whole history of Israel, these 16 books of prophecy were written in one specific window. Yes, there was prophecy going on um, all the way from the beginning, right? Moses stands as um, kind of the epitome of, of a prophet um, for the Old Testament. And, and he definitely stood as a mediator between God and his people, and he delivered God's message to the people. But, but the books that Moses wrote were not books of prophecy. Um, 
And again, with the prophets that we find in the Old Testament narratives, those aren't books of prophecy. And so there's really a narrow, a pretty narrow window that all 16 books of prophecy fit into. We know that God spoke to Israel specifically by the law, um, you know, at the beginning. And the intent for, was for that to stand until it was superseded by the new covenant. So the period of the prophets, um, they are concerned with enforcing God's law, or God enforcing his law through them, um, pro, uh, pronouncing the blessings and the, and the curses and the warnings through them during those years. And, and those years were characterized by three things that I, that I want to point out here, um, that the book points out. One is that it was a time of unprecedented uh, political, military, economic, and social upheaval, right? Think civil war um, and other nations uh, warring against Israel. Uh, second of all, it was an enormous, there was an enormous level of religious unfaithfulness, right? Uh, there was disregard for the Mosaic law. And, um, you know, think of um, Baal during uh, the time, Elijah's time. Uh, the people would go after other gods, and so the um, religious unfaithfulness was was really high. And then third of all, shifts in populations and national boundaries and so forth. Th here, think uh, civil war again, the division of the of the kingdom, um, and things like that again. Warring nations, and um, uh, we're, we're even going to look at a, at a section here in Hosea of, of boundaries being moved between the north and the southern kingdoms, and, and, and things like that. So that, that's kind of the larger context. Now, specific context, again, is going to change from book to book. Each prophetic oracle that we see in the books of prophecy is given in a very specific setting, uh, much more specific than, than that large context that I just gave. And we don't have time to mention them all, much less go into the details, um, you know, diving into them at any kind of depth. And so because of that, that's where the resources are really going to come um, in help, um, and they're going to come in. Um, they're going to come in handy. Yeah. Um, sometimes I struggle with idioms. So here's what we want to know at a minimum when looking for from those resources. Three things that we kind of want to know at a minimum from whether it's a commentary, from a Bible dictionary, or from your study Bible. And that is, you want to know the date, you want to know the audience, and you want to know the situation that they were writing in. That is going to greatly help you in. Uh, making sense of what's going on there in that passage of prophecy. So here we're going to break out into our second um, session here, our second set of um, breakout rooms. And what I want you to do in this breakout session is I want you to read Hosea. We're going to go back to Hosea and we're going to read chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. So Hosea chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. And after you're done reading that, I mean, you can discuss it if you want to just after reading it, but after reading that, I'm going to give you a hint. That particular portion of prophecy refers to what is going on in 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 5 through 9. Again, 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 5 through 9. This is the historical and the specific context for that prophetic oracle in Hosea. And so then after reading the two, I want you to discuss how one illuminates the other um, and how they help to inform each other and what you can glean there for knowing what the historical context is there. So again, I'm gonna give you 15 minutes to go ahead and discuss that in your groups. So one who is uh, managing the video, go ahead and hit pause or stop sharing screen or whatever it is and push them into their breakout rooms. All right, hopefully had a good discussion around those two passages. So information going into that passage, right, in Hosea is knowing, and this is this is a little bit extra than what um, Second Kings would have given you, but this is a war oracle. It's written in a, in a style and a form that it's known as, it would have been known as a war oracle. In other words, it was announcing God's judgment through battle. Is, is what that what that means. So there's specific elements to it. There's a call to alarm, there's a description of the attack, and there's a prediction of the defeat. And that's that's what encompassed a, a war oracle. And the date is 734 BC, right? Which puts it in that context of 2 Kings uh, chapter 16. And that scene gets played out where you've got Judah, 
right? Um, which is the southern kingdom after the division um, of, of the, the whole kingdom. Um, and they're attacking Israel, which is the northern kingdom. And so there's a civil war um, going on, which is something that, that is pretty continuous. But Judah, Judah's attack is actually a counterattack because Israel and Syria had already attacked Judah and they invaded Judah and kind of pushed the borders um, of Judah back. And so through Hosea, God is sounding the alarm for those that are in the ter territory of Benjamin. Um, and, and we see that being being played out in this in, in this passage in, in Hosea. And then Hosea also um, proclaims that there's there's going to be judgment. God's wrath is going to fall both on Ju Judah and on Israel uh, because it was a violation of the covenant. It was a violation of the covenant first and foremost uh, with God. And so I hope that you saw and I hope that you got that, that this, being able to put the prophecy in its historical context, is, is much more effective and meaningful in reading of the prophecy. Um, and so that's what we what we want to be able to do, and um, even more meaningful, being able to look at it side by side with the um, the prophecy and the the, the historical context or the the, the, um, the narrative that's written in the Old Testament as well. Um, much more useful that way. So then, let me give you another a, a principle. Beyond that, that's probably first and foremost uh, the most important thing that we could do is putting the prophecy in the context of the narrative. Um, which will help us greatly. But another principle that will help us greatly is think back to when we, we looked at the epistles. When we looked at the epistles, um, we were talking about thinking in paragraphs, right? Thinking of each paragraph as um, a unit of thought and trying to trace the author's thought from paragraph to paragraph um, as we looked at the epistles. So rather than thinking in paragraphs, because this style is, is vastly different than what the letter of the epistles were, um, we have to think in oracles. And so looking at, and what we looked at in Hosea chapter five is an example of that, that's, that's an oracle. So same idea, instead of thinking in paragraphs, thinking in oracles. And this is difficult, and I'll admit, this is difficult because many times what the prophet said was presented in a run-on fashion, and there's uh, no distinction between when uh, what I said earlier, where one ends and the next one begins. And a lot of times what they said over the years was um, was collected and then it was written down um, without any real clear divisions. And there are exceptions, um, such as in Haggai and in Zechariah, um, those are dated. And so that makes it a little bit simpler um, to read and to, and to put into its right context. But just, Going back to what I've been saying about uh, resources, this is where a study Bible, which has the cross references and the commentaries below, um, you can follow the progression of the prophecies in their context, and that's going to make it extremely helpful. So now let me just kind of flow in with our, our last few minutes here into some hermeneutical suggestions. Okay, exegesis, understanding then and there, and the hermeneutics is um, learning to apply it to us here and now. So if the task of, task of exegesis is to be able to put the prophecies into their historical context, um, how are we to hear that then in ours and, and what's our task? So much what we talked about in the epistles applies here, right? Um, the common sense applications aspect of it, right? We see message messages all over the books of the prophecy concerning um, repenting and turning from sin and um, depending on God. All those things are, are what I would put into the common sense application. Um, it's just as true for us today to, to depend on God and to turn from our sin um, as it was back then when, when Israel was hearing it. But here are three other things um, to address during this. And so first, don't get hung up on the prediction of the distant future prophecies, okay? The distant future events. That wasn't a prophet's primary function, as we've already said. And most of those predictions, though it was in the future for them, were in the past for us. So still look at the context. Still, still aim for putting it in its proper historical context and to look at it in that. Second of all is um, you'll find second meanings of prophecies in the New Testament. Okay, what do I mean by that? Some Old Testament prophecies seem to have a clear meaning in the Old Testament, but when they're referenced in the New Testament, they're, they're given another meaning. Um, and 
the way that I want to explain that is the fact that that is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit was working through writers like Paul in the New Testament to be able to look at Old Testament prophecy and to extract some meaning that we never could place into that. Um, that is supernatural, um, God-given inspiration in that moment. And it does not give us license to exercise the same kind of allegorical application for our lives. So we have to guard against that. So that's the second thing I want to say. Third um, is there is all throughout the biblical prophecy, the Old Testament prophecy, there is a dual emphasis on orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Orthodoxy meaning the right belief, orthopraxy, the right practice or the right actions. And again, all throughout there's there's that duality and there's this balance that God is calling Israel to. He's always calling them to have the right beliefs, but then to have the right action stemming from that right belief as well. And, that, and they play off of each other as well. And that is just as true for us today. It doesn't change with the new covenant. We are called to a right belief in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us and to a right belief based on that on that right belief or the right actions based on that right belief right um, and those things are that it, that idea as a whole is true just as true for us today and so the prophets then these books of prophecy serve as reminders to us of that um, that we need to put our faith into action Right, it's not just enough to have the right belief, um, just as just as um, just as that is important for us to have right belief in God and Christ and what He has done, but also the right action stemming from that, um, which guide our everyday life and we offer our lives as living sacrifices to God, um, holy and pleasing to Him in everything that we say and do to give Him the glory. So I hope that was useful um, for you in, in being able to perhaps look at the books of prophecy in a, in a less daunting fashion. Um, and yes, a little bit more legwork. We've got to be able to put it in the context. But if we do that and if we're faithful to, to study it, then um, we will reap the rewards, being able to, to glean that meaning and, to, and that um, relevance for us in today. Let's pray. Father, thank you again. Thank you again for this time. Thank you for... Um, your word and thank you for the timelessness of your word god that we as we read it you know thousands of years later um it's it's not empty of meaning for us partially because of who you are because you are never changing you are the same yesterday today and forevermore and because of that as we look at who you were and how you were communicating with your people in the old testament um, a lot of those principles are the, are the same for us today and how you call us and our attitudes and how you call us to, to walk our faith out and, um, and, and, th and all those things that we've discussed this morning. And so thank you for your word. Um, may we be diligent in our study of it and may we be uh, continually filled with your Holy Spirit so that we may glean all that we can from it and draw us to a better relationship with you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And God bless you.